Good morning again. I'm so glad that you're here today. You know, you've already done something great. It's barely 1130 and you have already given God your Sunday. And you know, when you give God your first day of the week, you are inviting him to lead you the rest of the week. So uh, well done. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here today. I also want to take a, a minute, if we can, and just welcome all who are watching uh, online. I know not everyone can be here physically, uh, but uh, I'm glad that you're watching, glad that you're joining us. You know, you can participate in the mission, even from where you're at, just by sharing that on Facebook, uh, sharing that on your page, and that, that really helps us get that word out. So I encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, you know, we are located here in Colony, uh, but our vision is to is to make Jesus famous throughout the Capital Region. So wherever you're watching from, uh, welcome. Can we uh, welcome uh, those who are, are watching online this morning? Hey, you should have received a message sheet in your message sheet in your weekly, and so you can just take that out. That'll help you to follow along. We don't do it every week, but when we do, you can follow along. Uh, with our with our talk today, pull that out. Uh, I also want to make a, a comment about the app. Uh, we're having some really bizarre glitch uh, with the app. It's still working. Uh, we welcome you if you're if you're curious to just download that app uh, we, and uh, and to use that. But um, you'll notice you'll notice if that if it's glitching for you. It's not it's not for for everyone. Uh, but but uh, I mean the apps for everyone. The glitch isn't happening for everyone. Uh, but uh, if that's happening, that's not on purpose. I don't even have to tell you what it is. If it's happening, you'll know, and it's not on purpose. And um, you know, let's just move on from that. Good. Have I sparked your curiosity yet? You'll all download that app uh, at some point. Hey, today we're talking about Jesus' boldest. Claim. We're starting a brand new series today. It's going to run for four weeks, uh, and today we're talking and, and throughout this week we're going to be throughout this series we're talking about uh, just Jesus' boldest claim. You know, Jesus made a lot of bold claims uh, when he was uh, in act in ministry uh, here on earth. Uh, a lot of them, even for religious leaders, so people who were like like it, they were supposed to be the ones that love God the most. For them, the stuff that he said was just too bold uh, to take, uh, and so. Uh, uh, when he would make these claims, uh, they would first, throughout uh, the story, they first began to try to refute the claims that he was making. But then when they couldn't, they tried to discredit him uh, as, as the person who was making these claims. And then when they couldn't do that either, uh, they got angry and, uh, and they, they sought to eliminate him, to eliminate him from the conversation altogether because they couldn't just ignore it. And so uh, they sought to eliminate him uh, by killing him. And in fact, it was the night before his crucifixion that Jesus made this claim uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, he was with his disciples, his closest followers, uh, and he said to them, he said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the, the, over this series, we're going to look into this verse and, and, the, and the verses surrounding it. And we're going to talk about what Jesus meant specifically about being the way. And what he meant when he said, I am the truth. And what he meant when he said, uh, I am the the life. And we're going to look at this claim because uh, in this claim, he was saying something very important about God, about himself. But there's something else. When we see what Jesus was claiming here, we also discover that he was saying something shocking about you and me. Uh, for every one of these I am statements, behind it, there's a therefore, because I am, therefore, here's what you, here's who you can be. And so we're going to look into uh, these verses and these words and, and the message uh, that Jesus is bringing to us because in each one of his statements uh, about himself, we see uh, a very important promise that he gives to us and a very life-giving purpose uh, that he gives to us. Uh, and so uh, I encourage you to, to, to commit uh, to this series and to keep coming out uh, and seeing this central claim, learning what this central claim to Christianity uh, says to you. Uh, I don't know, how many remember, uh, you'd have to be a little old school, uh, Joe Namath's famous guarantee. Anybody remember Joe Namath's famous guarantee? This is not 
Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs. This is completely different. This is Namath's Famous Guarantee. Uh, Joe Namath was a quarterback, and he guaranteed that the New York Jets, he was a, he was a quarterback for the Jets, he guaranteed the New York Jets, who were huge underdogs, were going to beat the much more powerful Baltimore Colts in the Super Bowl. And uh, the most shocking part of that story is the New York Jets were in the Super Bowl, right? Uh, but they were there, uh, and he made this claim that they were even going to win it, uh, and, and it was this bold claim, and, uh, and he was right, actually. Uh, if you're maybe even a little bit older, you may remember Muhammad Ali, right? He, he had a, a pretty bold claim. What was his bold claim he made all the time? I am the greatest, right? He, he, was, he made that claim all the time. That's kind of debated as to whether or not that's true or not. Uh, and, and then if you're more recently, maybe you've heard of the name LeVar Ball. Anybody heard LeVar Ball? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. LeVar Ball is, is famous not for anything that he's done. I mean, he's other than siring children, I guess, uh, because he is, uh, he, he's famous for making bold claims uh, about his kids. Uh, and that's certainly up in the air as to whether those claims are, are, are true or not. But every one of these, these guys, and, and you can probably think of other bold claims throughout history, every time someone makes a really bold claim, it, it just it invokes a reaction, doesn't it? Because some people can just say stuff, and it's, and it's just kind of water, and it doesn't really matter, and it's kind of, okay, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Doesn't really, but then every once in a while, someone makes a bold claim. They say something bold, you just can't help it. It just invokes a reaction like with these guys. I mean, there are people who, who either love them uh, or they hate him, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of people uh, in 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 the middle. Well, Jesus' claim was much bolder than any uh, of these. You see, when Jesus said what he said about himself, he left no doubt about what he believed was true about himself. He left no room uh, for misunderstanding, and what he said requires even today. It did then; it does today. It requires a response. We can accept it and embrace what he said about himself. We can reject it, but we really can't ignore it. And we're going to talk today why that is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Uh, it's a claim that that, 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 that that speaks a lot of challenge into our culture, right? It's a, it's a claim that challenges kind of the prevalent worldviews uh, of, of the culture that we live in uh, here. Maybe even it challenges uh, your own uh, worldviews here today. Uh, when Jesus said, I am the way, uh, I mean, he was saying, I am the only way to God. I mean, understand that when he was saying this, he wasn't saying, look, look, I blazed the trail for you to follow. Jesus wasn't saying, uh, look, I am the example. I came and I set an example for you. And so uh, if you want to get to God, you got to try to live like me. And if you try to live like me, you do your best, then you will get to God. He wasn't saying that, that, that he's the example. He was saying, I am the path. I am the way. In other words, I went the way that you couldn't go. I went the way to the cross for you, and I became the way to God for you. Now, this contradicts uh, something in our society uh, called religious pluralism. And you can, you, if you're taking notes, you can fill that in. Uh, religious pluralism is this idea, this belief, ultimately, that, there, that multiple worldviews, that multiple religious worldviews can all be equally valid. Now it's not it's not tolerance, right? Tolerance uh, just simply means uh, that 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 two different worldviews can kind of coexist, right, within the same world, and we don't have to kill each other over it, right? We're, we we absolutely believe uh, in tolerance, right? Uh, Laurel or Yanni? Laurel. 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 Right. Yanni, right. So, but we can coexist, right? Whatever your whatever your 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 view is, we can coexist. Uh, so, so, no, it, it's not tol religious pluralism is something more uh, than tolerance. Religious pluralism uh, it asserts that there are multiple paths, multiple equally valid paths to God or to spiritual peace. And so, in a broadly pluralistic society like ours, Jesus is claimed to be the only way to God. Well, it's just a little bit narrow. 
When Jesus said, uh, I am the truth, uh, he, was saying, uh, he was saying that his words and his actions, but even more, he himself, his person is the absolute truth. Understand, Jesus wasn't just saying, like, the stuff that I'm saying is true. Right? He wasn't merely saying that, like, what I'm doing is true as if it lines up with a truth that exists beyond himself. What Jesus was saying is, I embody, I am the truth. John, he introduces Jesus to, John is, is one of Jesus' disciples, and when he wrote his gospel, his biography of Jesus, he introduced Jesus to us this way. He said, the word, in other words, the word of God, the revelation of who God is, the narrative of God, became flesh and, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This contradicts uh, our culture's faith in something called relativism. Uh, in, in, our, in our culture, relativism is basically the belief uh, that, that all of truth, and, and morality as well, but all of truth exists only in relation to the culture, to the society that we're in, to the historical context uh, that we're in. And so uh, because of that, uh, truth can shift as culture shifts and change as, as time uh, changes. Uh, and so uh, you may hear this, like what's true for you may not be true for me, or, or, or what's good for you uh, may not be good for for me, in a relativistic culture uh, like ours that, 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 that holds on uh, to that, uh, that belief dearly, Jesus' claim to be the truth <laughs> for everyone. That's just a little bit narrow. When Jesus said, I am the life, his claim to be the life, he was claiming to be the God who gives eternal life. Life. Jesus said the same thing uh, a little bit. John tells us, he says, he also said this, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, God the Father, has eternal life. Eternal life is a God-connected kind of life. Eternal life is a life that begins now and goes on forever. He says, it's, it's, the, it's the life of God within, within you, and you will not be judged, but you've crossed over from a, a, a condition of spiritual death to a condition, condition of spiritual life. For just as Father, God the Father has life in himself, is the source of life in himself, so he has granted the Son, I have come down here onto earth, God the Son, uh, also to have life, the, the, the animating source of life in himself. Now, now this is just filled with claims that contradict uh, something uh, our culture's faith in something called naturalism. Now, your friends, people that you work with, may not use these kinds of terms, but you 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 you're probably recognizing uh, the, uh, the the thought pattern. Naturalism is basically the belief that all of reality is what we can see. It's it only what we can see and what we can touch and what we can hear, you know, uh, what's, what that, that all that we have right here is all that there is. And so uh, naturalism kind of dis, it, it discounts anything that's supernatural, so the idea that Jesus is God, and spiritual, so the idea that this is, that we are eternal, be, eternal beings with souls that will uh, go on to everlasting life in one direction or another, much less the idea of a judgment that we will be accountable to standing before our creator. See, Jesus' claim to be uh, the way, the truth, and the life, when he said, no one comes to the Father except through me, uh, the objection to that, to his claim, and I'll just tell you right now, if the reaction to you, if you claim to believe what he said, uh, you'll just be considered a little bit too narrow. But this is the central message here of Christianity. It's what we call uh, the gospel. Is the gospel really that narrow? Well, Jesus called the way to God narrow. Uh, the, one of his followers named Matthew, he wrote uh, a gospel, a biography, and he, and he said that Jesus said this, uh, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. 
but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to eternal life. And only a few find it. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I think it's kind of human. We don't like narrow, right? Like, I don't know if it's just American culture or if it's human nature, uh, but uh, we, we like options. You know, I, I, I like to have uh, options. I, I, I like wide, wide roads, you know, that I can drift. You know, I, I like to, to be able to customize things, right? I, I like to synch, syncretize things. I want to take a little bit of that, that's good, and a little bit of that, and I'll bring that together, and I'll, and I'll kind of make my own uh, way, right? We almost kind of treat it like it's our, it's our right, it's our entitlement uh, to make our own way and to uh, make up our own truth because, after all, it's our own life. So we come face to face with this claim of Jesus to be the way for all people, to be the absolute truth, to be the source and only source of everlasting and eternal life for all people. It's a bold claim, and it forces a response. We can accept it. We can reject it. But we really can't ignore it. And here's why. What if it's true? I mean, what if Jesus is the only way to God? What if Jesus is the absolute truth about God, about yourself, about life? What if Jesus is the only source of a God-connected life here and forever? What if Jesus is the only one who can rescue us from a life now and a life forever of being separated from God, continuing on a trajectory away from the source of of life and all that is good? I mean, if he is, if he knew that he is the only way and he didn't tell us, how evil would that be? I mean, I hope this never happens to you, but imagine if you were to wake up uh, in the middle of the night and your house was on fire. Uh, and, and you see the door open and you see a fireman uh, down the hall and he's calling to you uh, and he's telling you, look, this is the way, there's only one way out, follow me, this is the only way out. Now, would you consider him intolerant? Would you reject him and decide to find your own path? Or would you be glad that there is a way out? And would you find it merciful that he came to find you and to lead you down that way? Wouldn't it be horrible if he knew that there was a way and he didn't tell you? If that's what's going on, if the way is that narrow, then Jesus' claim is not bad news. Jesus didn't come, uh, see, to, to, to eliminate all the other options. He didn't come to close off other paths. It's not like there was a way to get to God, and then Jesus came and said, you know what, my way is better. I want you to choose my way. Jesus came, uh, and he opened up a new path, the only path. Uh, When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me, he was bringing good news. That's what the gospel is, good news. It's not good ideas. It's not good advice. Jesus didn't come, uh, the message of the gospel isn't, hey, here's one option. Here's, Here's something you can try. The gospel is the good news that there is hope. The gospel is narrow. It tells us that Jesus is the only one. The only one who can rescue us. Who can rescue us from hell, yes. Uh, But he's the only one also in this life that can rescue us from from a life of wandering, uh, going, uh, you know, without any clear direction or purpose. He's the only one that can rescue us uh, from a life of wondering uh, whether or not we're on the right track, wondering what the truth is about God and ourselves. He's the only one that can rescue us from patterns of self-destruction that we just seem to repeat. He's the only one that can rescue us uh, from uh, the traps of superstition and, and empty religions and, uh, and, 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 the, and the, the ugliness of self-righteousness. It's good news that Jesus came to be the way, the truth, 
and the life. But good news for who? Because how can a message so narrow really be good news? I think the message of, of the gospel's narrowness is often, well, I, I'm sure of it, it's, it's often misunderstood. You may sometimes hear people talk about, uh, you know, uh, salvation uh, and, and, and talk about it as if there's, there's some who are, are chosen for it and there's others uh, who are not. As if the work of Jesus on the cross was good for some people, sufficient for some people, but not uh, for everyone, not intended for everyone. In fact, there's a long right, division in the church uh, over this uh, idea, this kind of debate. But uh, I, I, I believe the truth really comes down to, uh, to this question. Who do you think the Bible's about? Uh, because if you think the Bible is about us, right, if you think the Bible is about humans, then uh, you could read it and say, well, well, this is all channeling down to God's plan uh, to choose an elect group of people. And he, he sent Jesus uh, to, do that, to, to do that work. He got an elect, an elect group of people that he wanted to save, and, and he chose Jesus to do that work. And those who think uh, that the Bible is about humans, uh, that, that kind of that makes sense. I, I don't think that's true. I think the Bible is not about humans. I think the Bible is about Jesus. And when you understand that, you recognize that actually the whole story uh, is about, it's all, it's all heading toward God choosing one elect person. Jesus, the only begotten Son, to save the whole world. So that whoever turns to him and believes in him becomes identified with him as the elect, the chosen, the ones that, that have chosen him and receive that salvation. You see, John, he tells us this. He says it this way. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them all the right to become the children of God. The gospel is the invitation to find salvation where, where narrow meets inclusive. Let me show you uh, what Jesus said about it. In Matthew chapter 10, he said, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. He said, whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved and whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. He said, everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Uh, John said, uh, whoever, oh, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. He said, my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He said, everyone who lives and believes in me will never truly die. Luke tells us that the first church picked up this exact same message. Uh, and Peter, on the very day of Pentecost, uh, he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter later preached, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The Apostle Paul, he wrote in his letters to the church, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to save salvation of everyone who believes. He wrote, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. He wrote to his disciple Timothy, God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There's about 30 more of these verses, but are we getting the picture? Just one more. Apostle Peter wrote to the church, he said, God is patient, not wanting that any should perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That word repentance uh, 
Uh, repent, it, it literally means an, uh, to, uh, to pull an about face. It means to stop going in the direction that you're going uh, and to turn around and to face in the other direction. So spiritually speaking, uh, that means to stop going down the path of self-righteousness where you're counting on your self-righteousness to be good. It's to stop going down that path of self-sufficiency where you're trying to lead yourself. Instead to stop, to turn around, and to put your trust in Jesus to be your Savior and the leader of your life. It's to stop going down the path of any other way you're trying to get to God. Maybe it's through legalism it's, it, or, or it's, it's through some other uh, religion uh, and to turn around and to recognize Jesus and to trust him as your Savior and your Lord. The gospel is narrow. It, it's Jesus. It tells us Jesus is the only one. But the gospel is also inclusive because it tells us that it's for everyone. Jesus is the story. God has chosen him, set him apart, predestined to be the only one for everyone. The question is, will you make him the central figure in your own story? Will you find your way and your truth and your life in him? Will you find your rescue where God has placed it at that intersection of completely narrow and completely inclusive? Will you accept that Jesus is the only one? Understanding that that eliminates options. Will you embrace that Jesus offered, freely offers that to all of you? because that will eliminate obstacles. The gospel is this. Jesus is the only one who came to save everyone. Look, there's no one else coming for you. There's no one else who has come to bring salvation. What sets Christianity, the Christian message, the gospel apart from every other religion is that every other religion shows us what to do to get to God. The gospel tells us what God did to get to us. There's no other way to get there yourself. And the beautiful message is that no matter who you are, God is calling you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've wandered, no matter how much you even right now struggle with doubt, no matter how good you are, no matter what your background is, you can come into a real relationship with the living God. And you can do that, the New Testament tells us, by turning to Jesus and trusting in him. So when we talk about turning to Jesus, understanding that, that, that we're, we're admitting in that moment that you don't have, we don't, we're not able to rescue ourselves. We're not able to be good enough. And, and, no matter, and maybe you've come to that point where you've been trying so hard that you recognize there's something broken inside. And you need to be, you need to be fixed. You need to be rescued from that. We turn to Jesus as turning away from that self-sufficiency and that, that self-righteousness, those, that, uh, the, those lies that, that we believe. And then we trust in him. We're saying, I'm turning away from that, but I'm trusting in you, Jesus, that you are the way and you are the truth and you are the life. You're the way to God. It's, it's by putting my faith in you that I'll find rescue, that I'll find healing. Understand it's also saying, and I trust you to be the truth. Like your way is always right, and where I conflict, I'm always wrong. You're trusting Jesus to be the life, the one that will give you that God, bring you into a, a relationship with God, that God-connected kind of life, who will give you his spirit to help you in this life, to empower you to, to live a life that you couldn't on your own. 
when we turn away from ourselves and turn toward Jesus. We're not joining a church. We're not joining a religion. We're saying, Jesus, I trust you to bring me into a real relationship with a real God. Maybe this morning you've never done that. Maybe you've only ever had a relationship with a church or a religion. Maybe today you're ready to say, Jesus, I want to find my way and my truth and my life in you. I admit that you're the only one, and I thank you that you have come to save everyone. I eliminate the options. I trust in you. I see that you've eliminated the obstacles. So I respond to your invitation.